Welcome to the Hunt, Kill, Cook podcast. My name is Andre, one of the hosts, and in this episode, we are going to be telling the story of Ishi, the last Yana Indian, the father of bow hunting in North America. The opening story is a little bit on the longer side, but it pays off in the middle, and it is totally worth it. Going forward, telling high quality, compelling stories from the history of hunting and some of the world's greatest hunters is a staple of this podcast. Our aim is to provide you the best content possible. We're so grateful that you're here and thank you for listening to the Hunt, Kill, Cook podcast. Now enjoy the show. The Yana were hunters and warriors. Instead of being diggers of roots like the other tribes in North Central California, they lived by the salmon spear and the bow. Their range extended over an area south of Mount Lassen, east of the San Joaquin River for a distance of 50 miles. From the earliest settlement of the white man, hostilities existed between them. This resulted in definitely organized expeditions against these Indians, and the annual slaughter of hundreds. The last big roundup of the Yana occurred in 1872, when their tribe was surprised at its seasonal harvest of acorns. Upon this occasion, a posse of white men killed such a number of natives that it is said that the creek was dammed with dead bodies. So it came to pass that from two or three thousand people, the Yana were reduced to less than a dozen who escaped extermination. These were mainly women, old men, and children. This tribal remnant sought the refuge of the impenetrable brush and volcanic rocks of the Deer Creek Canyon. Here they lived by stealth and cunning, like wild creatures they kept from sight until the white man quite forgot their existence. It became almost a legend that wild Indians lived in the Mount Lassen district. From time to time, ranchers or sheep herders reported that their flocks had been attacked, that signs of Indians had been found, or that arrowheads were discovered in their sheep. But little credence was given to these rumors until the year 1908, when an electric power company undertook a survey across the Deer Creek Canyon with the object of constructing a dam. One evening, as a party of linemen stood on a log at the edge of the deep, swift stream, debating the best place to ford, a naked Indian rose up before them, giving a savage snarl and brandishing a spear. In an instant, the survey party disbanded, fell from the log, and crossed the stream in record-breaking time. When they stopped to get their breath, the Indian had disappeared. This was the first appearance of Ishii, the Yana. The next morning, an exploring expedition set out to verify the excited report of the night before. The popular opinion was that no such wild man existed, and that the linesmen had been seeing things. One of the group offered a bet that no signs of Indians would be found. As the explorers reached the side of the volcanic boulders where the apparition of the day before had disappeared, two arrows flew past them. They made a run for the top of the slide and reached it just in time to see two Indians vanish into the brush. They left behind them an old white-haired woman whom they had been carrying. She was partially paralyzed. Her legs were bound with swaths of willow bark, seemingly in an effort to strengthen them. The old woman was wrinkled with age. Her hair was cropped short as a sign of mourning, and she trembled with fear. The white man approached and spoke kindly to her in Spanish, but she seemed not to understand their words, and apparently expected only death for in the past to meet a white man was to die. They gave her water to drink and tried to make her call back her companions, but without avail. Further search disclosed two small brush huts hidden among the laurel trees. So cleverly concealed were these structures that one could pass within a few yards and not discern them. In one of the huts, acorns and dried salmon had been stored. The other was their habitation. There was a small hearth for indoor cooking, bows, arrows, fishing tackle, a few aboriginal utensils, and a fur robe were found. These were compensated in the white man's characteristic manner. They left the place and returned to camp. The next day, the party revisited the site, hoping to find the rest of the Indians. These, however, had gone forever. Nothing more was seen or heard of this little band until the year 1911, when, on the outskirts of Oroville, California, Some 32 miles from Deer Creek Camp, a lone survivor appeared. Early in the morning, brought to bay by a barking dog huddled in the corner of a corral, was an emaciated naked Indian. So strange was his appearance, and so alarmed was the butcher's boy who found him, that a hasty call for the town constable brought out an armed force to capture him. Confronted with guns, pistols, and handcuffs, the poor man was sick with fear. He was taken into the city jail and locked up for safekeeping. There he awaited death. For years, he had believed that to fall into the hands of the white man meant death. 
all his people had been killed by the white man. No other result could happen. So he waited in fear and trembling. They brought him food, but he would not eat, water, but would not drink. They asked him questions, but he could not speak. And so they thought him crazy. His hair was burnt, burnt short. His feet had never worn shoes. He had small bits of wood in his nose and ears. He neither drank, ate, or slept. He was indeed wild or insane. By this time, the news of the wild Indian had gotten to the papers, and Professor T.T. T. Waterman of the Dep Department of Anthropology at the University of California was sent to investigate the case. Ishii became a subject of a study and lived happily for five years. From him, it was learned that his people were all dead. The old woman seen in the Deer Creek episode was his mother. She died on a long journey to Mount Lassen soon after their discovery. Here he had burned their bodies and gone into mourning. The fact that the white man took their means of procuring food as well as their clothing contributed, no doubt, to the death of the older people. Half starved and hopeless, he had wandered into civilization. When asked his name, he said, I have none because there were no people to name me, meaning that no tribal ceremony had been performed. But the old people had called him Ishi, which means strong and straight one. He was the youth of their camp. He had learned to make fire with sticks. He knew the lost art of chipping arrowheads from flint and obsidian. He was the fisherman and the hunter. He knew nothing of our modern life. He had no name for iron, nor cloth, nor horse, nor road. He was a man of the Stone Age. He was absolutely untouched by civilization. He turned back the pages of history countless centuries. As an artisan, he was very skillful and ingenious. Accustomed to primitive tools of stone and bone, he soon learned to use most expertly the knife, file, saw, vice, hammer, axe, and other modern implements. Although he marveled at many of our inventions and appreciated matches, he took great pride in the ability to make fire with sticks from Buckeye. He could do this in less than two minutes by twirling one on the other. About this time, I became an instructor in surgery at the University of Medical School, which is situated next to the museum. Ishii was employed there here in a small way as a janitor to teach him modern industry and the value of money. He was perfectly happy and a great favorite with everybody. From his earliest experience with our community life, he manifested little immunity to disease. He contracted all the epidemic infections with which he was brought into contact. He lived a very hygienic existence, having excellent food and sleeping outdoors, but still he was often sick. Because of this, I came in touch with him as his physician in the hospital and soon learned to admire him for the fine qualities of his nature. He taught me to make bows and arrows, how to shoot them, and how to hunt in his fashion. He was a wonderful companion in the woods, and many days and nights we all journeyed together. I learned to love Ishii as a brother, and he looked upon me as one of his people. But in spite of the fact that he was happy and surrounded by the most advanced material culture, he sickened and died. He contracted tuberculosis and faded away before our eyes. We did everything possible for him and nursed him to the painful bitter end. After months of misery, he suddenly developed a tremendous pulmonary hemorrhage. I was with him at the time, directed his medication and gently stroked his hand as a small sign of fellowship and sympathy. He did not care for marked demonstrations of any sort. He was a stoic, unafraid, and died in the faith of his people. He was cremated and his ashes were placed in an earthen jar. On it is inscribed Ishi, the last Yana Indian, 1916. And so departed the last wild Indian of America. He closes a chapter in history. He looked upon us as sophisticated children, smart but not wise. His were the qualities of character that last forever. He was essentially kind. He had courage and self-restraint. And though all had been taken from him, there was no bitterness in his heart. His soul was that of a child, his mind that of a philosopher. With him, there was no word for goodbye. He said, you stay, I go. He has gone, we stay. And he has left us the heritage of the bow. That's an excerpt from Hunting with the Bow and Arrow by Saxton T. Pope, 1923, abridged. All right, welcome to the Hunt, Kill, Cook podcast. My name is May Kale. I'm one of your hosts, and I'm accompanied today by... I am Andre, one of the other hosts of Hunt, Kill, Cook. 
That's right. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast, guys. This is a new thing that we're trying uh, alongside with all the other content that we're hoping to bring to you on the 2022 season. 2023 season? 2023 season. 2023, bro. Yeah. Wow. Okay. How it flies. How it flies. Well, guys, uh, I figure that, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we give you a mix of informational things, a little bit of storytelling, and so, in and, and a way that we can relate uh, from those stories to our modern day hunting and what that looks like. So what you guys just heard was the story of Ishii. Andre, elaborate on that. Ishii, what an incredible story. And there was so much more to that. I had to cut a whole lot out so we could make it possible yeah. for the podcast. No joke. He came in and he was like, I have a story, but look at it. <laughs> And I was like, Andrew, yeah. we need to uh, make it more abridged. And he's like, it's already abridged. Yeah, the, there was, there's a lot more uh, to the story, but those are some of the highlights. And um, there's a whole lot that he taught Saxon Pope. Uh, and later on in that book, um, which we're going to cover more in depth in a later podcast, uh, is one of the free great free books that are available uh, under public domain. Um, it's just an, an incredible story and all of the lessons that we learned. You know, some people say that Fred Bear is the father the of father modern of hunting. Modern hunting yeah. and, and to an extent, that's true. He definitely popularized it. Um, but even before him was Saxton Pope and Arthur Young. And then even before them, they learned a lot of this stuff from Ishii. And just the thought of the last, you know, why, truly, they call him a wild man. But you know what I mean? He, he was in a... A, a tribe of people that were uncivilized by our current modern standards. And they had so many ways of doing things and they had really figured out, you know, how to manipulate nature. Uh, and one of those is hunting, especially Absolutely. with the So um, now like you, you've sunk a, a quite a bit of time into the story of issue. You've been reading a lot about it. We've been, we've been talking about it for some time and I know you've been really excited about sharing this with our audience. So, I want you to make a definitive statement here. I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, no. Fred Bear, Ishii. Oh, Ishii. Yeah. Uh, Ishii. Yeah, for, I, I, for sure. I, I could see that coming a million miles away. You've been smitten yeah. by the wild man. It's it's cool. The Some of the things that he was able to do um, and the, the some of the other stories that are highlighted in that book are just, they're hilarious. Yeah. They're, it, it's yeah, guys, you have no idea. He just was telling me about some of the stuff that he's going to try this season while he's bow hunting. And oh, yeah. I'm just excited to be there to witness it. Yeah, I'm going to probably leave the loincloth at home. <laughs> <laughs> you probably should. I think uh, I think uh, the smell will give you away. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. There's not enough baking soda in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. All right, you heard it here first. Yep. Mm-hmm. So how are you doing, buddy? I'm uh, doing what are, great. What are you excited about this this hunting season? Oh, man. Um it kind of came up quick. This summer flew by, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. I wanted to get more hunting permission, um, and that hasn't really happened. Still have uh, one real good property, and I'm still looking for more. Uh, but I am excited to be hunting with my recurve bow. Uh, part of this Ishii and some of the other hunters that I've been uh, reading about, um, you know, that traditional bow is I've always been enamored with. I mean, since seeing Legolas, you know, yeah. flinging arrows at orcs when I was a kid, I was like, man. Oh, to be Legolas. Uh, to be Legolas. To be Legolas. That's right. I'll be sliding out of the tree. How much shorter do you think the Lord of the Rings would be if Legolas had a sniper rifle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, over. It's over, right? <laughs> it's over, right? Yeah, yeah just getting to Os Gilead and, <laughs> and waste Sauron's eye, right? <laughs> right. I, I keep seeing this video uh, pop on my reels because, you know, we're, we're both big uh, Lord of the Rings nerds. And uh, I keep seeing this video where somebody asks Tolkien, why did they just jump in Os Gilead and then just kind of rounded Middle Earth? To get to uh, to mortar, and, and his answer was epic. He says, uh, "I don't know. Just don't ask. Don't <laughs> ask. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up." So uh, yeah, it was great. Um, so okay, uh, Ishi, incredibly influential for you this season, and and how are you feeling now that we're here and you have your recurve? I know that you had some trouble with it. Yeah. Um, you even made a video about it, which you guys should definitely check out. But uh, tell me a little bit about about what your experience has been going from shooting um, exclusively a, rec- uh, a compound bow and then now going to a recurve bow. Humbling. Yeah. It has been humbling. Uh, my, I've gotten to a point, and, and probably a lot of the listeners out there can relate, uh, where you develop a certain competency with your compound bow, especially when you take one from year to year and you're not buying a new bow, it's like the same old thing. You basically get it out of the case a few weeks before season 
you know, tighten up a few things and, and you're stacking pretty tight groups. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's where I had been with my, my compound year after year. I've had the same one for like, you know, 10 or 11 years. And it's just, it's been automatic. I get it out and, you know, you, know, you want to, there's a few things to tighten up as far as, you know, get the site back if it's maybe it got bumped over the right. season or whatever. But, um, you know, as long as the strings are good, it's good to go. Yeah, and, I remember actually, this is funny, just not to interrupt you, but I remember uh, when I first got my bow, when I first got into this whole thing, uh, and I remember you taking your bow out of your box and and saying like, oh yeah, I haven't shot these things since last year. And it was around the time when I was just getting getting introduced to to you know the world of compound bows and bow hunting, and I was just trying to trying to get used to the idea of stacking arrows, right? Like I just want to make sure that I have a tight group. And I remember asking you, like, hey, like, how, how are you, how do you think you're going to fare now that you haven't shot it for a whole year? And you're, and, and I remember your answer. I remember thinking, like, this guy is the, the cockiest son of a gun <laughs> in the world. It was like, I remember just saying, like, well, you know, I think I'll be fine. And, you know, here you come out. We're about, I, remember, I think we were about 30 yards out of that day. And, and then you just put in, you know, just put in it where you want it. You just put in where you want it. And, now, you know, here we are th- three years later, and I've had my own experience with, with the bow, and and I, I was able to experience that. Like, out of the box, I was able to just put it where I needed it, and I was mm-hmm. like, okay. Uh, once you build that little bit of that muscle memory, it just kind of comes back to you, but this is a whole other beast. Yeah, this has not with been With the recurve bow. Yeah, the recurve bow has been, uh, like I said, humbling. Uh, there's There are so many more things that affect the, your shot. Um, you know, there's no let off. Right. So you being able to hold steady and taking that, you know, I, I'm shooting like a 65 or something pound bow. Um, it's probably a little less than that. And now I'm shooting like a 50 pound recurve. And, you know, I thought, oh, that's, that's a little weak. But, you know, being able to hold that back at full draw for that couple couple moments before you release, um, you know, that let off, I didn't realize how much I was taking that for granted. And right. when there's no, and, and eventually it, as you continue to pull, it just gets heavier and heavier, right? And you're in full draw. And then your fingers are touching the string and that's a whole nother thing. You know, I don't have a mechanical trigger release or, uh, you know, to help me with a perfect clean release every time. And it's just, it's gritty, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's a real connection to archery and, you know, I don't have a sight and I'm learning to shoot. They say instinctively, I don't know if it was, I can't remember who it was, but uh, he was, he's like really famous for being an instinctive archer. And he said, you know, I could shoot, uh, you know, perfectly in the dark because I'm that good of an instinctive archer. And so they're like, talk oh. about cocky. Yeah. And so they're like, okay, let's put him to the test. And they put him in a dark room and they shine like a light on the wall. And so all he could see was the light and he couldn't see his bow or anything like that. And he, he sh- shoots his arrows and misses wildly. <laughs> and uh, and so the myth, instinct. yeah so the myth of air big air quotes instinctive shooting uh, instinctive aiming uh, was put to rest right uh, really all that our brains are doing is uh, an advanced form of gap shooting right you're just memorizing what your sight picture looks like I know I might get some hate for that a lot of people are instinctive archers and that's how I I basically focus on my spot with no sight right and just I'm I'm locked in. And when I release, that's ideally where my arrow should go. But really, in my peripheral vision, my brain is built in the, the idea that that's what my sight picture is. And when it's there at 20 yards, that's when you release and you're going to hit at 20 yards. And you just memorize those as yeah, you go back and forth. I mean, I guess part of it is also just kind of understanding distance, right? So, like, mm-hmm. we, you're going to, like, learn over time to say, oh, yeah, that is 100% 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards. You get Once you get understanding that distance, I can assume or, or presume, I guess, that, like, as you raise your bow, your side picture changes depending on what you're looking at. It's not like you just move in one pin to one spot or one pin to the right, other. Right. Uh, your your whole side picture is changing with a recurve bow. I remember being at the at the men's retreat uh, a year ago, and these guys had recurve bows, and that was my first experience with a recurve bow. And I I drew the bow, and it was about, I, I would say probably like forty to fifty pounds, and. Uh, mind you, my my bow, my personal compound bow, is a seventy pound bow. So I was like, oh yeah, I can probably pull this. And then I pull it, and I'm holding it, and my whole body shaking. Yeah. And Ben Roby, uh, shout out to Ben Roby, who yeah. brought all his bows to the man's retreat. He's looking at me. He says, you can't hold it that long. Yeah. He says you you have to like draw, quickly look at your target and shoot. Um, if if you try to hold for a really long time with uh, with a recurve bow, you're gonna struggle. Yeah. 
And uh, and when you said that people take for granted, for granted the, the let off, I 100 percent understand what that means. Yeah, it's uh it's fatiguing for sure. I used to be able to shoot like you know 30, 40, 50 arrows at a time, but now I'm like after I get past 10, 15, my hands start to get tired. You know yeah. that 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 release uh, with the finger release is uh, no joke. How is um how is this changing? What what are you doing new aside from from the recurve bow this year? I, I know I'm adding some things, but again, I'm still on on my compound bow. I'm I'm changing bows this season. There's a lot that's going on with with how I'm going to pack my kit. But I'm interested in hear about how you are going to pack your kit because it's going to be a different beast with the recurve bow. Yeah, you're yeah. shooting from the ground this year. Yeah, that's something that you haven't done. You know, proactively since you know, yes. well, a long time, I guess. Yeah, I, um, you know, it would be whatever the situation called for. Uh, I would, I would hunt on the ground, but mostly out of my saddle. Uh, you know, we had uh, designated trees and or, or just mm-hmm. general localized areas that we could go to back and forth, and we'd know, hey, we could climb this tree. Deer are going to come from this direction, and so on. Uh, but this year with the recurve, I'm taking a more uh, aggressive approach as far as hunting from the ground. Um, I, it won't be. You, whether it's my compound or recurve, I'm going to be on the ground a lot more. Um, I love my saddle, and that's that's great. Um, I heard or I read uh, a Warren Womack quote that one deer from the ground is like 10 deer from a stand. And there's just something special about it. And I took a deer this year uh, or last year with um, on the ground, and it was a very, very uh, surreal moment. And uh, it was face to face. It was. Yeah, I was uh, about to say you're you're face to face. It, yeah. it, it feels a little disengaged. I can I can imagine from a from a stand or from from the saddle to just like uh, here's this animal that cannot see me. It, the, the odds are a little bit more even if you're on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of their senses mm-hmm. are keyed in to finding threats on the ground, and they don't usually look up. You know and. So you have an advantage when you're hanging out in a tree, which is great. I have no, no qualms about that. Um, you know, we're trying to put meat in freezers, and right. that's the most efficient way uh, to do it outside of shooting them with a gun from distance. Right. So which brings me to, uh, to our next point, uh, content. What, what are we going in the future? What's the future of our channel? The future of our channel. Uh, one thing that is extremely important to me is redefining what is considered a trophy. I'll give you a small uh, anecdotal story. Uh, my wife hunts it on occasion, and we're watching something from the hunting public or whatever, and there's a like a dorky little buck that, that pops out, and the guys in the show are going to pass on it because their shows, you know, they're trying to go after a nice buck. And I asked my wife, I said, would you shoot that deer? And she said, no. I said, why? You've never shot a deer before. You're, what, what, what's the deal? And she goes, well, it's not. It's not big enough, you know. You gotta have the, gotta have a rack, and and that just that, I don't know. Something that did something to my spirit, knowing that here's a person, and I've heard this before from others. This is your wife. Yeah. Even more, right? Like. Yeah, it it did something to me, and and you know, a person that has never had any kind of success as far as you know, actually connecting with a deer. She's been out several times, had some close calls, but uh, never has sealed the deal yet. Um, and I'm fully confident that, that she will in the future, but that she would hold out and she would pass on something. Uh, for me, I'm like, it's your first deer. My first deer was the tiniest little yearling doe, uh, you know, and I was like 14 or something, and I was just giddy, absolutely giddy. It did not matter. Any deer, if it's your first. And so I think there's this culture of, you know, antler hunting. And uh, hunting, back to Ishii, uh, is, is really about putting meat you know, they didn't have freezer on the table. Freezers, on the table yeah, right? But putting meat on the table. And uh, and so I, that's very, very important to me. And so this season, I want to highlight that just because it's not a monster buck, and we may, that may happen that we shoot a monster buck. Right. And get it's it on not camera. like we're going to turn our nose up when if, if a monster comes by. Yeah. You know, like we're going we're gonna to kill it. Uh, but it, it's, it's an entire different mindset when you're thinking about, hey, the goal of everything that we're doing here is so we can feed our family. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you guys head over to our website honkilcook.com, you can read a little bit more about ourselves and our stories. And uh, part of mine is that I come from a communist country where it's very difficult for you to feed your family. So I have come to really appreciate not just like Second Amendment rights in America, but also the ability to provide for your family in a more rudimentary way than going to the store. Like you're not you're not just going to you know to the freezer aisle and pick up some steaks. 
you can go to the woods <laughs> and, and get some get some deer yeah. steaks. Is that not possible where you're from? That is not possible where I'm from. Uh, hunting is illegal. Hunting is illegal. It's illegal. Yeah. So yet another privilege that we have here in modern America that uh, places all over the world don't have access right. to. Absolutely. Yeah, so to turn your nose up at a doe that comes by because you're looking for a large headgear. Check your privilege, bro. Check your privilege. <laughs> Check your privilege. Yeah, which is a, which is a challenge uh, for sure. And I know guys uh, get tired. They don't want to shoot doe because sometimes they find it easy. And so I would encourage them to maybe up the challenge. If you find that uh, you know sniping does out of your tree stand with your compound bow or your um, crossbow or whatever is... Don't, to, don't shoot it with a crossbow. If you're an able-bodied man, if you're an able-bodied man, you have no business shooting a crossbow. That's that's a that is a take. That is a take. That okay. is a hot take. Hot takes. Yeah. Um, you know, if you find that too easy and you want to up the challenge and you think the epitome of all challenge is to shoot a, a mature five-year-old, you know, swamp donkey. Swamp donkey. Change, change your circumstances. That's my challenge. Change your circumstances. Make hunting more difficult. Get on the ground or try a, a traditional bow or something something to make it, you know, go naked. I don't know. There's a lot of things that you could do to up the challenge. Throw up from a tree. Yeah. Slit his throat. That's right. Rambo style. Rambo style. Yeah. There, there's a lot that you can do to change your circumstances and Dude, make it more challenging. First blood, though. I don't know. I haven't seen it. You've never seen Rambo first blood. <laughs> No, I've seen the old Rambos. Give me, give me your best Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't <laughs> You're Christians. Yeah, you know. Do you get any guns? You got any guns? No guns. No guns. No guns. <laughs> get back. Go, Go back. back. Go, Go back. back. Get, get guns. Go I get it. That's embarrassing. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was really terrible. Yeah. Um, so you could Rambo it. Yeah. Uh, and and so that is my my challenge. Uh, if for people and you taking doe and putting meat in the freezer is no small task. And especially if you're new at hunting, do not pass it up. You can't eat horn. That's what we say around here. That's right. You can't eat horn. And you know, we got to get some shirts made up that say trophy doe. Trophy doe. Yeah. That's, that's merch coming. Merch, merch coming. Merch coming. Shameless All right. Point. So let's, let's go back to the story, the story of, of Ishii. Let's, let's touch base on, on where this episode started. So um, you you found you found the story you, you completely changed. I'm I'm listening to it here, and I'm just in awe of how uh, the description of this man uh, is, is portrayed in this story. Like, uh, you know, he is he has a, a child's uh, you know mind. Like, well, what was that last line? Like, yeah. towards the end. Yeah, his soul was that of a child. His mind, that of a that philosopher. philosopher. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible way to describe a man. Can you imagine, like, um, it was so many people, like, the fear of oblivion, right, is dying in your life counting for nothing and not being, and not being remembered. The fear of oblivion. This, this is not it. <laughs> not <laughs> this it. man is remembered as having the soul of a child and the mind of a philosopher. And, and, and here we are. The year is 2023. How many years now since this was written? This is 1923. Yeah. That this is a hundred years 100 old. A hundred years old. I did not. Here, that did not occur to me. And here we are talking about Ishi. Relevance. This this man's life, who was no, he was a nobody, right? He wasn't even right. named by his own people, right? Not you know, he was young and he learns all of these things, and then he becomes such an influence in our modern culture of hunting, teaching men how to hunt with a bow and arrow and how to make them, and all of all of those techniques and all of those. Uh, design principles. I mean, they've evolved over time for sure over the last hundred years, but a lot of those still stand into what we're shooting today is very similar to what was going on, you know, hunt for hundreds of years. It blows me away that we live in such a culture um, that that romanticizes this idea that that you can just go through life and die and your life mean absolutely nothing. All this we have, I'm about to get, you know, just completely down on culture right now. But like we, we, you know, have all these younger people, younger generation just saying like, hey, your life doesn't matter. You don't have to have children. You know, like down to the very basics, like you don't have to have children. You can just be selfish with your life. And here we have a man who came from absolutely nothing and gave back so much. Some, we're 100 years later and we're, we're finding relevance in this. And it's immortalized by his story and how he related to people. Listen to this. 
right here. This is what marks Ishii to me. Let me see if I can find it. Um, he did not hold bitterness. Even though all of his people were killed, hunted down like animals and yeah. killed frivolously, which is horrible, embarrassing history. He did not hold any bitterness in his heart. I know. Look at look at the state of our culture this day. Everyone wants to be a victim about something. Yeah. And here we have a guy that didn't even have a name. He was literally a victim. Yeah. He was an actual victim, unlike some unlike some people out there that, you know, tried to be a victim about random things that, that maybe happened to them or not happened to them and happened to other people and just like secondhand victimhood. Yeah. He took control of his circumstances. That's right. Well, awesome. I think uh, I have one more story to share. Let's let's go for let's, it. Let's go for it. So uh, hopefully you're still with us, and if you're with us, you'll you'll get to determine whether this story is fact or crap. So here we go. This story, we're gonna call it uh, the story of Mr. Gordon. Okay. This story comes from a guy named Gordon. Mr. Gordon was an avid hunter in the great state of Maine. He loved going out with his father as a child, and as he got older, he began to hunt. He began to hunt with his friends. One year, Mr. Gordon decided that it would be really cool if he could get if he could go up north in the state of Maine to hunt near the national park. He knew a public hunting area that was near a small town that would be absolutely perfect to stay nearby for their hunt. He invited his usual group of friends, but none of them could make it. So instead of hunting uh, the usual areas near his hometown, he decided to make this a solo trip. This would be proven to be a mistake later on. He drove three hours and a half and made it there uh, to a small town where his Airbnb was located. He took a turn on a long winding gravel road to a small but cozy cabin he would call his own for the weekend. He grabbed the key from the hideaway rock outside of the, outside of the cabin and made his way in. He unpacked his bags and settled in for the night. The night went by fast, and while he was while it was still dark, he made his way into the woods. He walked for a couple miles into the wilderness before settling in behind a deadfall. He sat there for about 30 minutes in complete silence, when from out of nowhere, he heard a quiet voice whisper, Hey, what are you doing here? He turned around, and he sees an old man staring down at him with a menacing look on his face. I'm hunting, he said quietly. You aren't allowed to hunt around these parts, he said. It's always the same. I know where you came from. You're just one of those big city folks that come and stay at the cabin up by the mountain. Get out of here before I call the rangers, he said. He made his way back to the cabin to connect to the internet to, to use Onyx to find another hunting spot um, near where he was. So he went back in the woods after that and for the evening without any success. He then later made his way back and realized that the door was open and some of his stuff has been, had been moved. He was weirded out by it, and he tried to relax and watch a movie to get his mind off of it, but he thought it was really odd. He remembers clearly locking the door, but he got back, door is unlocked, stuff is, you know, brownished around, some of the zippers are open, and he's wondering what in the world happened. He chucked it up to being tired, maybe actually forgetting to zip up his bag and everything, but, um, you know, just to kind of get the nerves off, he turns on the TV uh, and starts watching. Uh, a movie. He falls asleep in the in the living room and he wakes up um, later in the night. He makes his way up to his room, closes the door, closes the windows, and lays down, but he can't fall asleep after taking the nap that he did, I guess. So he turns to the TV and starts watching some black and white movie. After a couple minutes, he begins to fade out. So he starts hearing footsteps in in the in the cabin. And he chucks it up to like, oh man, I'm, I'm so sleepy. I'm like starting to think that this movie is happening to me. So he turns off the TV, rolls over, and tries to fall asleep. And as he's falling asleep, he hears heavy breathing coming from inside the closet in his room. This dude jumps out of bed, grabs his gun, points it at the closet door, and shouts loudly, get out of there or I will shoot you, is what he said. So... He, in that moment, he realizes, like, am I just being insane? Is my mind playing tricks of me? Uh, he leans over, flips the light on, and slowly sees the door opening. Out of the closet comes the same old man that he had run into earlier in the day with a big smile, missing the front tooth, and says, I almost got you. 
He holds him at gunpoint until the police shows up. Thankfully, he had signal, and they took him away. I almost got you. I almost got you. So, what are we thinking? Fact or crap? There's some serious mistakes that this guy made. Absolutely serious mistakes this guy made. I don't know. Uh, crap. According to the internet, this is a fact. This is a fact? How terrifying is that? Can you imagine? First of all, Mr. Gordon, bro, do better. Do better. Do better. Yeah, that's rough. You get back, you find your place ransacked, and you don't think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to check this place real good right now. Yeah, right now. I'm clearing the house. Yeah. I don't care what I've got, even if it's my bow. I'm like around corners. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's like, but thankfully, I mean, it's thankfully he had a gun. I mean, it would have been a bad day for the for the old man to be shot with a 308. Yeah. No excuse. No excuse. Yeah. So the moral of the story, always be ready. Don't get caught with your pants down. Yeah. Literally or metaphorically. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Mr. Gordon almost got got. He almost got got. What That's does right. that mean? I almost got you. What was he going to do? I don't know. Duh. Gosh. I don't. Mm -mm. Anyways, uh, I think I think we're approaching a wrap up for the first episode of the Hunt Kill Cook podcast. So, um, yeah. Should we, should we tell them that they should uh, leave a comment in iTunes? Can they do that? I think they could. Okay, great. Even mm -hmm. if it's a crappy one, like, hey, you guys suck. Give up. Like, that's cool. Put that in there. Thanks for the view. Well, thanks so much for listening to the first episode of the Hunt, Kill, Cook podcast. My name is Mikhail. And I'm Andre. And we'll catch you guys next time. Ow. We do that every time. Boom. Out. <laughs>